2 Corinthians 5.19. To wit, aren't you glad we don't to wit anymore? <laughs> to wit, that means how that, or now how, or how, how that, to wit, how that, God, was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, word reconciliation, katalagi, means exchange, adjustment, restoration to the divine, favor, atonement, reconciliation. We saw what atonement means, and the whole list of appeasing and being merciful and annulling your bad deeds, you know, and all of those good things. Well, that's a part of this definition. And reconciliation. When two people are reconciled together, it means they are now in harmony with another. We're going to be reconciled to God. Now, we get the word not there again. Not any. He's not going to be puting, not imputing. No not imputing. So if you know not imputing the world, their trespasses, but they're going to be reconciled, who is left out? There's no one left out. This is the salvation of the whole world. Now God has already reconciled himself to the inhabitants of the world. The redemption has already been paid. It's a done deal. Sin has already been judged. Now all that remains is the judgment of the sinners. I go to theological seminary for 180 years. You will never learn that the purpose of judgment is to reconcile the sinner to God. That's what it's for. He said, no, it's to torture the hell out of them for all eternity. Why? Because God hates them. Why? We said, they're his enemy. Well, he says, we have to love our enemies. Yeah, but God, God doesn't live by his own rules. He tells us to love our enemies. <laughs> With him, that's impossible. He's going to torture his enemies for all eternity. I don't think so. This is all nonsense. How has God reconciled to the world now, and yet he's going to judge most of humanity in, in a resurrection? How is that so? Anybody explain that? Well, think of some of the basic scriptures. Christ came, and he said, to die for our sins. There's a penalty for sin. Christ paid it. The penalty is paid. Well, if the penalty is paid, and God is reconciled to the world now through that penalty payment of Christ, why do we have to go through judgment? It just means that the debt has been paid. The debt has been paid. Let's look on a human level. You're brought to court because you owe the IRS $100,000. The judge says, I'm going to wipe it clean. I'm going to pay your debt. You don't owe $100,000. Can you then go out and act as though you had no forgiveness at all, and this year tax time comes around, and again, you owe $20,000. You don't pay. You said, why should I pay? The judge forgave me my debt. But that was your debts in the past. When you have your debts in the past cancel out, that means you stop doing the same thing all over again. But men are doing the same thing all over again. So, they have to be judged. The outcome is already known. The debt has been paid. People can read that, they don't see it. The debt's already been paid. But if you don't straighten up and live right, he's going to straighten you up and make you live right. That's what judgment's all about. Judgment is not about paying the debt. The debt's already paid. Now you've got to learn to straighten up. You've got to learn to repent of why you had the debt in the first place and that you don't have the debt again. This is a conversion of the mind. We teach children this. We forgive them for doing something bad. And hopefully in the love and forgiveness of what they did bad, they won't do it again. Or if they do, you have to punish them or judge them again. Okay. In connection to that, I have John one twenty nine. 
The next day, John sees Christ coming and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Which is taking away the sin of the world. Is taking away. That's the way Concordant and Young translate. He is taking away the sin of the world. If that is still, today, as we read that, is taking, is not a thing of the past. Because, again, this is the Greek era's tense. Past, present, future. How is he taking away the sins of the world in the future? Through judgment. Through judgment. Now, here's one. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15. How does that prove God's going to save all humanity? It says nothing about saving all humanity. That verse proves God will save all humanity. How? How does it prove it? What? You'll be alive. No, but that, that won't do it either, see? Because then we have this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, I think we already commented on, for as in Adam all die, and Christ shall all be made alive. Yeah, where will they be made alive? In the lake of fire, be tortured for all eternity. That's where they'll be alive. It doesn't say they'll be saved. I want to get us off this one-track thinking that you can only use a scripture that says all will be saved. Listen, those scriptures are all true. It's just that theologians and the people, they won't accept it because this word all doesn't always mean all. So I'm going to show you scriptures. There are other ways to skin a cat. There's other ways to prove it without using the word all. This one says, the last enemy that shall be, there's no doubt about it, it's going to be destroyed. It shall be destroyed is death. How does that prove the salvation of all? Where does the church say that the majority of humanity is going to be tortured? In fire, in hell, in the lake of fire. What is the lake of fire? The second death. It doesn't matter what kind of death. If it's death, it must be destroyed. I mean, they never wrap their mind around the fact that the lake of fire, which is the second death, is the death of all death. The judgment of that fire brings about the death of all death. So as long as there's a, a second death in operation in the lives of billions of people, that enemy has not been destroyed or, as it says in the Greek, abolished. It doesn't mean just, you know, crushed or broken up or destroyed, but done away with completely, abolished forever. If death is abolished, that means the lake of fire is not eternal. Because the lake of fire is the second death, and if it's to be abolished, there won't be a place for people to be tortured. Therefore, they have to be saved. And we read in Revelation 20:14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death was cast into the lake of fire. Why? Why does it tell us that? We know people are cast in there, but how is death cast into death? Death is the death of death. All things must be abolished. All sin, all evil, all that is bad that leads to death, must be abolished. And the last one, the last enemy of all enemies is death itself must be abolished. So the lake of fire has to be abolished. Why? Because it is the second death. It's got to be abolished. Therefore, there is no eternal fiery death. Everyone will be saved. Now here's some more scriptures I have here that you might not think either fit. Notice in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, this word will here is the strong form of the word will. Absolutely. Absolutely. God has said it will happen. How does this prove the salvation of all? Well, whatever his will is in heaven, it will be the same in earth. Is this God going to have people being tortured in heaven? It's nonsense. Well, then he's not going to have people tortured on earth. The lake of fire is on the earth. His will... 
Thy will be done. The same way as your will is done in heaven, and there's no death, dying, torture in heaven, it must be that way on the earth too. And there's only two realms, heaven and earth. So if his will is done in both of those places, and he's going to abolish death, and he takes no pleasure in death, and now we have the strong form that this is not he only wishes that men, but his will will be done in heaven and earth, all have got to be saved. There's no other way around it. Notice this verse here in Jeremiah. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire on the Moloch, which I communicated them not, neither came it into my mind. The Hebrew word there is heart. Certainly it came into his mind. He knew they would do it. He didn't take pleasure. There was no emotional pleasure in his heart that they did this, that, that they should do this abomination. What? God is telling us it never entered his mind that people should burn in fire. That's an abomination to him. And yet we're told he's going to burn people in fire for all eternity? And God calls it an abomination? God is going to perform an abomination for all eternity? Can you not see where the church blasphemes the name of God? Every turn. You say, oh, but they sing these beautiful songs and, and they say these pretty prayers and all this. That's the deception. That's the whited sepulcher. Yes, the outside is beautiful and pretty and whitewashed and gilded with gold, and, but inside is dead man's bones and every perverse and foul thing. Well, yeah, it wouldn't deceive anybody if every aspect of it, even the outward appearance, were corrupt and vile and filthy and stinking. But it's not. It's a whited sepulcher, so pretty, full of dead man's bones and vile corruptions. Look at this one here, Jeremiah 32. This is back just a few verses in the same chapter we just were. Ah, Lord God, behold... You have made the heavens and the earth by the great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Does God desire, let's just get back to that weak word, desire. Does God desire that all men be saved? Yes. Is, is it too hard? It's too hard for him to save them. I would like to ask a theologian that. They would have to sidestep the question and say, well, it's not a matter of being too hard. It's a matter of men don't wait a minute. So you're saying it's too hard. God wants it, but it's too hard. It's not up to him. Then it's too hard. It's too hard for him to convince everybody to live right. It's too hard. Can he do it? Can he convince everyone to live righteously? And they say, no, he can't, because he gave us free will. In other words, with man having free will is too hard for God if he gives men free will to get them to live right. They would have, eventually, unless they... See, I think I can take anybody, any theologian, and he, I will show them the scriptures. If he will not accept the scriptures, then he must lie. I can make everybody lie. You have to lie. You can't contradict the scripture without lying. You can't. You cannot. But you have to be skilled in the scripture or you won't know how to do it. I mean, they'll sidetrack you. Well, man has this free will. All right, give him the free will. So man with his free will cannot 100%. All of them, all of these free will people, they can't all of these free will people be made to live godly and righteous. It's too hard. If it's easy, it would be done. You say, no, that's easy. Well, then it can be done, right? 
You can just say, oh, that's easy to do, but you can't do it. No, if it's easy, it can be done. Since it can't be done, it must be too hard. Am I off the track here someplace? Is anything too hard? No. The apostle thought, God, you can do all this stuff. Who can be saved? And he said, well, with man, that's impossible. But with God, saving everyone is possible. Why? Because nothing's too hard for God. And he desires for all to be saved. That's it. Oh, you're proof texting right. You bet I am. You bet I am. <laughs> you know? And I say with all their proof texting that everything is contact. To hell with all of it. When you want to prove God wrong. 1 John 4, 8. For God is love. You're proof texting, Ray. You're darn right I am. God is only love in the context of 1 John 4. No, He's always love in any context. All contexts. In context, out of context. Before there was a context. Now, here's another good one. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. That's speaking of, well, we always say speaking of the faith, but speaking of both. You know, I'll say, but that, what? The grace and the faith. But that. You're saved by grace through faith. But that. That what? That grace and that faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So the grace is a gift of God. The faith is a gift of God. Not of works. Your works do not enter in. So whatever you do or don't do can't disqualify you. Not ultimately. Because it says we are his workmanship. Or I think a better word is concord. We are his achievement. Created in Christ Jesus under good works. Which God has ordained that we should walk into them. Now, how does that prove the salvation of all? It doesn't say anything about all people being saved there. It says how those who are saved are saved by grace. Through, but how does it prove everyone? Anyone? You can't see it? Come on. Think, think, think. How does that prove everyone? There you go. Denny nailed it. It's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift. If it's a gift, God is a respecter of persons if he doesn't give it to everyone. Because your works can't buy it. It's a gift. It's free. That's what grace means. Gratuity. Free. We say in Spanish, you say gracias. What does that mean? Thank you for doing so. The free is a gift. Gratuity. Grace is free. The faith, oh, you've got to supply your own faith. No, the faith too, it's a gift of God. Not of works. So, everything is a gift of God. What you contribute doesn't work. It's, it's what's the gift of God. That's what works. We are His achievement. His workmanship. Can anybody be their own achievement in acquiring salvation? No. It's all of God. Well, what about the good works you do? Well, He's already ordained you. You have to walk in them. You have to. He's going to make you. Not against your will. He's going to make you want to. Gosh, why can't theologians think that? God will make people want to do right. You know, they say, well, God's not going to force us to love him against our will. Of course not. Whoever suggested such nonsense. He will make you, against your will sometimes, want to. (laughs) Listen. These things are not, I mean, they are very deep. These are the deep things of God, but they're not incomprehensible. The simplest concepts in the Scripture are not understood by the church. Not by the doctors of divinity. They don't understand them. Listen, when Paul was going to Damascus, why was he going there? He had something in his mind. He had something in his heart. He had a will. 
to go there and persecute Christians. And he had letters from the high priest giving him authority to do it. That's where he was going. That's what he wanted. That's what his desire was. That's what his will was. No. God struck him down whoo, with his blinding light from heaven. Scared. Scared the wits out of him. I mean, imagine that. In the middle of the day, you're walking down a road. We're like a lightning bolt. You're knocked to the ground. And then you hear a voice. You say, Ray, what the heck do you think you're doing? Where do you think you're going? I say, who's that? <laughs> is that you, Lord? At least Paul had the sense to say, what is it, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus Christ, who you persecute. Was that what Paul was willing and desiring at that moment? To be struck down by a light from heaven and have the everything scared out of him? No. Did God do that against his will? To God? Yes. But guess what? Very quickly, Paul's will became God's will. Why can't we see that? Why can't the church see that? Why can't the church see that God can make your will His will, make His will your will? Why can't they see that? Right there is a perfect example. They can't see it. They cannot see it. Why? They're blind. Blind as a bat. Christ said, your will, my will be, will now be your will. You thought you were going to go to Damascus. No, you ain't going there anymore. To prove. You're going to go there to do my will. And guess what? Did Paul say, oh, for my dead body? No. Yes, Lord. Boy, you know, that, that, that one minute little theology course, you, 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 you couldn't learn that in the school of theology, in the seminary, in a lifetime. I don't understand it yeah but it was by his free will that oh, get out of here lying blasphemers ok so regarding Ephesians 2 8 if the grace and the faith and the achievement and the good works and the choosing and the calling are all of God how can man be responsible for his own salvation? And if no man is responsible for his own salvation, how can anybody be lost? There's proof everybody's got to be saved. Because it's all on God's terms. It's all on God's terms. Yeah, but you have to profess Christ. You will. Paul cursed Christ. God struck him down with light. Now he blessed Christ. That's how easy it is for God. Is anything too hard for God? Is it too hard for God to convert a sinner? Answer, theologians, well, yes, if they don't want to be converted. Blasphemers. They're not only heretics, they're blasphemers. What do you think it means that the Word of God is blasphemed in the world? Everywhere they take the Word of God, they blaspheme it. It's necessary what they do, but they're going to be held accountable in how they did it. I have here the absence of the word all works against the theologians. In the next three verses, we won't see the word all anywhere in here. And we're going to see that it means all. And the word isn't even there. First one. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 It doesn't say you come to see all that's lost, does it? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. If they're lost, he's going to seek them and find them. He said, but, none, but not all. No, you're perverting the scriptures. Here's some people that are lost. He's going to seek and save them, right? Why? Because he says so. Over here's some people that are lost. He will not save them. Right? No, you're making a liar out of the scripture. The only qualification we're looking for here. Are you lost? Yes. Then Christ is going to come to save you. 
You see that simple scripture? Who would have ever used that scripture to prove that all humanity will be saved? Right there it is. What are the qualifications to be saved? You have to be lost. We're all lost. It's apaluma. Destroyed, perished, lost. If you fit that category, and we all do, guess what? Christ came to save you. Here, if you to put the word all, they'd fight you on it. You think they came to save all that are lost. All means many that are lost. And the word isn't there. And because the word isn't there, it absolutely has to mean all. Because there's no qualifier. Many lost. All lost. Or many lost. No, just lost. That's the only qualification. Lost. Next one. For the Son of Man, and man here is anthropos, and it means a human. Okay? Is not come to destroy, apaluma, destroy, perish, or, or lose, men's lives, but to save them. Men's, M-E-N capital with an apostrophe showing possession here, is the same Greek word, anthropos, as Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, anthropos. So it just means human, a human, humanity. Jesus Christ did not come to destroy or lose human lives, but to save them. Again, we don't have the word all. But he said he had come not to destroy, but to save all them. Oh, if we put the word all in again, the theologians would say, I just said, all means many. Come to save many of them. Doesn't say many. Doesn't say all. It just says them. Who? Men. Humans. How many humans are there? As many as there are. What do you need to qualify to be saved according to this verse? In the other one, to be saved you had to be lost. What do you have to be here in order to be saved? A human. Can you see it? If you're a human, you'll be saved. Because he didn't come to destroy humans. He came to save them. What? Humans. That's all you got to be is a human. Look at the next one. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That means the preeminent, the biggest, the worst sinner. Paul said, that was me. If he can save the biggest and the worst, then... He certainly saved some that are not so bad. I mean, does that go without saying? If I can bench press 300 pounds, could I not more easily bench press 100 pounds? Well, come on. Of course. If Paul was the worst sinner and he saved him, or at least got him to repent in about three and a half seconds, what makes you think he can't get lesser sinners to repent in one and a half seconds? But that's not the point of the scripture that I want to draw your attention to. Like I said, the word all works against them. They want to use the word all? Fuck, let's take it out completely. Let's not, not only not rely on it, let's take it out. No more all. No longer going to say all. Take the word out. There is no word all. He didn't come into the world to save all sinners so that they can say, that means many. That means some, many, maybe even most, but not all. No, he came in the world to save sinners. If God's word is true, and God said the scripture cannot be broken, if God's word is true, according to this verse, what must you be in order to be saved? So right there it is. What must you be, according to this verse? If you are this, you'll be saved. What must you be? A sinner. Bingo. If you're a sinner, this verse says Jesus Christ came to save you. And he will do it. He said, you know, he came with good intentions, but you know how it is. No, he'll do it. He said it, he'll do it. Now, every man is not only going to be saved, but every man is going to be saved by fire. Notice... 1 Corinthians 13 to 15. I put 13 in there because it says every man... Now, 
most of the time, I think most of the time, at least a lot of the time, when it says every, like it says, not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, every is translated by the Greek pause, meaning all or many. And so we have a little problem with that all. That's why we're not using it. But here it's not. Here it says every man, and here every is hekotos, not pause. And it means every, each, one, everyone, every man, every woman. That's from Strong's Concordance. Here it doesn't mean all, meaning all or, well, as many as, no. Here the word means every, each, one, any, everyone, every man, every woman. No one left out there. No one. Every man's work shall be manifest by fire. How many are left out of that? How many men's work are not going to be manifest by fire, by trial and test in fire? How many? None. It's not pause, all. It means everyone is going to be manifest by fire. That's verse 13. And then verse 15, it picks it up again. If any man's work shall be burned, the same one, every man tested by fire, and if their work shall be burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet by fire. Who will be saved by fire? Every man there is. Because here, every is not pause, which can mean, well, as many as. No, every, no exception. And I have a, a whole installment in the lake of fire. Two judgments by fire. We either judge ourselves now or succumb to God's judgments and voluntarily judge. Or God doesn't give us that heart and we rebel against. But we're either judged now or we're judged later with the world. There's only two judges and they're both by fire. Now who goes through that fire? Every man. No exceptions there. The absolute every. So, if every man is tested by fire, and every man goes through the fire, and every man is saved through the fire, guess what? All humanity is saved. There it is. We don't need that word all, do we? Now, <laughs> if there's one verse the world understands... It's John 3.16, right? Now that one, the most well-known scripture on all earth, that one, surely, they understand. They have not a clue. Let's read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Then it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They say, well, there it is. Either you accept it, and you have everlasting life, or you reject it, and you perish. God does not save everybody. There's the proof. 1 John 3.16 Well, you know, the thought is not finished in verse 16. Let's continue on to verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, dot, 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 for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn it, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, it isn't that verse 17 is a contradiction of verse 16. It just explains it. And not the full explanation is there either. We know it's the sum of God's word that is truth. Not everything is explained in one verse. You have to look at other verses that talk about that same thing. For God so loved the world. That's the fact. That he gave his only begotten son. That's a fact. That whosoever believes on him should not perish. That's a fact. But have everlasting or Ionian life. That's a fact. If you believe in his son, you will not perish eternally. But you will have Ionian life. But they say, well, but if you don't, <laughs> you know, 
verse 36, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life, but he is not as a Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So you don't say, all right, you want another scripture to explain? There's my scripture to explain it. If you believe, you'll have eonian life. If you don't, you don't have eonian life, and the wrath of God abides on you. That's true. I have no problem with that. Well, then they all know I'll be saved. Yes, they will. How can you say? Because this is temporary. Because this is temporary. This is not the finality. Yes, we know that those especially believers are being saved in this era, in this age, in this church age. They are being saved. But all mankind is to be saved too. Well, they say, well, the many, not, not all. Well, actually, they say the many won't be. They even contradict the word all, which means that many has. But Okay, I'll agree with that, that whosoever believes should not perish. I mean, it almost goes without saying, but those that don't believe then would perish, right? Well, yes, yes, I'll agree with that. You know, when it says this produces this rather than whatever it doesn't say, which would be the opposite. Yes, that is true. They will perish for a time. But you see, the perishing is being contrasted with the Ionian life. So you could insert, they will not pass Aeonian. You see, they will not perish Aeonian, but have life Aeonian. But they say, but the life is eternal. That's not what he says. We, uh, this is talking about life with Christ and enjoying his reign, which is not eternal. It's because we're given immortality that we live forever, not because the word eternal is used. How is verse 16 true? Here's how it's true. For. The word for means because. Verse 16 is true because... Verse 17 is also true. Now, you could say that. that I mean, that's my own statement, but it's a true statement. That's what 4 means. Because, here's why verse 16 is true, is because God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Christ is going to judge the world, and then he says, I've come not to judge the world. Two different words. You have crisis and crino. This is the word crino. Do I have that in here? Yeah, crino, which means to punish, to sentence, to condemn, and to damn. He did not come to punish, to sentence, to condemn, and to damn the world, the population of the world, but that he would save it. So I say, oh, no, no, it doesn't say that he will say it. It says that he might. He might. Those words are not in the manuscripts. Now, even though they don't put them in italics, they are not there. In the Greek, it says that the world through him saved. That's what it says. World through him saved. Might be is not in. That's put in there to make the English idiom sound correct. You know, that he might or may. And even there, the word that's translated might or may, where it is in the Hebrew, also means must. I mean, it means might and may, that's true, but it also can mean must. But here it's not in there at all. It's just that the world, through him, saved. Saved, not might be, saved. So, if he didn't come to punish, to damn, or to sentence, but to save, then how can he punish or damn anyone? He's coming to judge, but that's a different word. Condemnation, sentencing, damning, putting down, guilty. Did not come for that purpose. So if he did not come to condemn, then no one can be condemned if he didn't come to do that. Because if he knows in advance he's going to do that, then he came to do that. He did not come to do that. Not the first time, not the second time, not ever. Why? Because Christ doesn't change. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Who would think this proves, 1 Corinthians 15.28, then Christ himself will be subject unto the Father that God may be all in all. How does that prove all humanity to be saved? Well, you have the same word all. Pause, right? Well, here's why. You can't say that the first all means absolutely all, but the next all, I mean just right together, means something totally different. You can't do that. 
God does not speak in such convoluted, deceitful ways in his word. If you say the second in all, that's all humanity, does not mean all, then you have to also conclude that when God says that he may be all, that God himself is not all. Who would suggest that God is not all? That he is lacking? He's not all that he wants to be or whatever. Only partly. It's nonsense. Well, whatever the all is, meaning that God is complete, and that's what it's talking about, completeness, being made whole. You know, like it says in Colossians, we are whole in Christ, complete. We are complete in Him, mature, whole. Listen, whatever God is, is what He will be in. See it? That God may be all. That's what He is. That's not us now. God will be all. Well, if God is all, and He is all, being all, be all, it's the same thing He's going to be in us. It can't be just in part. You can't say God will be all in part of humanity. can't say that. So even a simple verse like that, God all in all, absolutely proves all humanity is included. If God fails to accomplish all that he desires in this physical world, what assurance do we have that in the spiritual world he might also fail to accomplish whatever it is he set out to accomplish? Maybe we might get there and then someplace down the road there'll be some giant awakening that this whole thing is not working right. If God fails to save all humanity, it doesn't matter why he fails. If he fails, he fails. And if he fails, where he didn't want to or desire to fail, he's not God at all. That is no God. But God is God and he will save all. I put here bottom line. It's not necessary, nor are we obligated. It is not incumbent upon us. We do not need to prove our faith to the satisfaction of those who despise the word of God. I mean, if we know it, we know it in our heart and mind, (laughs) we're not obligated to prove it to these people who despise the word of God. We're not obligated.